So Luke chapter 1, verse 1 says this, Insomuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us. I just wanted to highlight that verse and remind us today that Luke is not writing in a vacuum. He is writing in a specific context, a specific time and place, which uh, he goes, I think, at great length to show us in the gospel of Luke. We will see several of these uh, fulfillments that Luke is talking about actually today as we're reading our passage of scripture. And so I wanted to start with one fulfillment or one prophecy of the Old Testament in particular, and that would be in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. As Adam and Eve have fallen from grace, as they have fallen and taken of the fruit which was forbidden, uh, God pronounces a judgment on Adam and Eve, and then he proceeds to pronounce a judgment on the serpent. In Genesis chapter 3, 15, this is part of the curse of the serpent. It says this, I, God, will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Satan and the spiritual powers of darkness at the time are being spoken to here. And God looked at them, God looked at the serpent and said, you have an end date, serpent. You have an end date, Satan. The woman's seed, the woman's descendant, is going to end you. It reminds me of the Count of Monte Cristo. I love that scene where Edmund Dantes is speaking to his unknown son at the time, and he says these words, do your worst, for I will do mine. I feel like God was saying that to Satan, like at that moment, like you will do your worst, but trust me, buddy, you, I will do mine. You have an end date. And we see all throughout the passages of Scripture, the Hebrew Scriptures, that Satan is attacking what would seem like the spiritual line that is going to bring about the Savior or the one who would crush the head of Satan. The, from the first moments of the Bible, after Adam and Eve, they have Seth, who is a godly line, and then Cain, his brother, kills him. Seth, or not Seth, but Abel, rather. And then Seth comes, and he continues that line. And then we keep going, and it's Noah to Shem, and then to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. And you see all of this turmoil happening all throughout the stories. You see during the time of the Exodus that the kids under two were being killed. During the time of Moses. The Bible continues to follow the spiritual line that we know from hindsight at this point, uh, would follow and would go to Jesus, would lead to him. So we get Easter eggs all throughout, and I call them Easter eggs. The Bible just calls them prophecies. Uh, we get Easter eggs of all of these things that are to come, but never do we get the full picture. Maybe the spiritual beings and the spiritual powers maybe they are thinking that through these persecutions, through these hiccups in the line that they can stop or prevent it. Um, but they are far from that. And God is only giving us and actually giving them only a little bit of the information at the time. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 8, one of my favorite verses, it says this, uh, talking about the wisdom of God and how God decided to save humanity. It says this, none of the rulers of the age knew None of the rulers of the age knew what God was doing whenever Christ came to this world. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You hear that? They would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But this foretaste is where we are going in the gospel of Luke. We are just at the beginning of Luke, and really... We're in the middle of redemptive history as we talk about the birth of the Messiah, which is also the climactic point of the story where the Messiah is born to this dark, lonely, and lacking hope, despair world. But it's one worth celebrating every year. And so that's what we do. So Luke chapter one, verse 26 says this. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel 
was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. I love how thorough Luke is, even in this setup. It says that Mary is betrothed to a man named Joseph. They were engaged to be married. They were already in a marriage contract. They had not yet consummated the marriage through uh, the consummation, the wedding feast, the wedding night. They had not done all of that yet in that time and culture. It was not an uncommon, and actually this is how it was practiced. The weddings were three stages, actually. You went into contract with someone and their family, and then you would have the wedding feast, and then you would have the consummation. Or you'd have the consummation first and then the celebration afterwards. Uh, this is not uncommon to how many in uh, Jordan, actually, as me and Kimberly were able to go to Jordan uh, this last year in March. It was March, right? April? Ah, whatever. Who cares? You know, I said it yesterday and I was like, is it March or April? I don't know. But anyway, and so we met a Bedouin there who actually is going through this very similar process. We're like, hey, what are you doing, man? And he's like, well, I'm taking people out to the wilderness. Uh, if you guys ever have seen uh, Dune, uh, that's where we were, Wadi Ram Desert. We were there, and we were seeing all of those sandworms coming up and everything, and we were running, and it was crazy. I recommend that you guys go. Um, <clears throat> No, but we met him, and he was telling us about this process. And he's like, well, you know, I'm doing this. I'm taking all you guys out so that I can earn enough money to uh, bring my wife in. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, that's, that's a different custom, you know? So we heard his stories and the stories of how they do it. So this was not an uncommon thing then. It's not an uncommon thing in a lot of cultures nowadays. But she was betrothed to Joseph. They had been in contract and he was to take her as his wife soon. Matthew 1.19 tells us this, that once Joseph found out that she was actually pregnant, Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. All right, so later on in the story of Matthew, we find that the angel actually visits Joseph and tells him, hey, it's okay, man. She is conceived by the Holy Spirit. And he's like, okay, all right, that's enough for me. Verse 28, and having come in, the angel said to Mary, <clears throat> this is what he says to Mary, he says, rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. So in this story, the angel comes on a little strong to Mary and it says that Mary's like, okay, what's going on, man? So she's processing, she's confused. She's like, thanks. Uh, and then the angel said to her, which is a common uh, response of an angel in this situation, uh, the angel says this, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Verse 31, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Verse 33, and he will reign over the house of Jacob, Jacob forever and his kingdom, of his kingdom, there will be no end. The angel and Luke, as he's writing this down consequently, are focusing on this account in the rich history of the Jewish expectation, the Jewish prophecies. We see that the angel tells Mary this, that you will name him Jesus. Jesus was actually a common name in that time, but also meant something. It meant God saves or God is salvation. And the angel tells Mary that you will conceive and he will be called the son of the most high. He's coming from the father. He is of the same essence of or as the father. You will birth the God man. And not only that, but he will fulfill the prophecy of reigning on the throne of David through Joseph's line. Isaiah chapter nine, verse six through seven says this, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, 
and the government will be upon his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So God in step with the Easter eggs that he had left, he said, I will fulfill this in this way. A virgin will conceive, a child will be given. You will call him mighty God, prince of peace, And upon the throne of David, he will establish his kingdom. Verse 34, then Mary said to the angel, how can this be? How can this be since I do not know a man? She, not that she never met a man, but that terminology is talking about she's not been in that encounter with a man. This doesn't make sense. How can this be since I have never known a man? Verse 35, the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, Mary, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that holy one who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall be called and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The Holy Spirit. There will be a supernatural conception, Mary. There's a lot of things we don't understand about that. And where there's mystery, we say, okay, just like Mary is going to say in just a moment. We say, okay, whatever you say, God. In verse 36, it says this, Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who has been called barren, unable to conceive. Verse 37, For with God nothing will be impossible. Listen, church family, nothing is impossible for God. God is in the business of doing impossible things. And we must remember that. We must build in ourselves reminders of that truth. Verse 38, then Mary said, this was her response to all of that, and this is a great response. She says, behold, the maidservant of your Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And it says the scripture's response, or that the angel's response was, it departed from her. So she said, have your way, God. We didn't uh, talk about Zechariah yet, but in uh, t- next week, uh, Eric will actually speak of Zechariah and Elizabeth a little bit more. Uh, it's in contrast to his response to the angel whenever um, he received the news that his wife would be pregnant. He's like, I, it was basically that of disbelief. And he's like, I don't believe it. Uh, and then he was calls to be mute for the remainder of the pregnancy and up to the birth. But Mary, she said, never mind the impossibility, never mind the difficulty, never mind the questions. The question that we all have for Mary is Mary. Did you know? (laughs) (laughs) Ah, you're welcome, you're welcome. Well, the truth is Mary didn't need to know. That's what we see in this account of Mary. She didn't need to know. She said, okay, whatever you say, let it be according to your word. Now Mary arose in those days, verse 39, and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah. Verse 40, and she entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. We don't know why she went there. Maybe it was the news that the angel had told her and she's like, I need to go help. I need to go help. Maybe it was the process of, uh, to process the information that she had. She's like, I need to go to my spiritual relatives and just process this with them. We don't know. But the angel told Mary that Elizabeth was pregnant. We do know that. And that Mary took a, some like 70 mile journey all the way to Zechariah and Elizabeth's house. In verse 41, it says this, now it happened 
When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the babe leaped in her womb because Elizabeth herself was pregnant with John the Baptist, who was a fulfillment of the passage of the scripture in Malachi, that one in the spirit and the power of Elijah would come and prepare a way for the Messiah. It says this, and it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with with the Holy Spirit. Verse 42, she spoke out with a loud voice and said, blessed are you among women. As she's looking at Mary, Elizabeth looks, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. By, but why is this granted to me, Elizabeth, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. Verse 45, blessed is she who believed, speaking of Mary, for there will be fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. So there was a noticeable move in Elizabeth as Mary walks into the house. John is proclaiming from the womb that this is the Messiah. And you wonder, like, does Elizabeth just piece it together because there was never a move quite like that before? And she's like, whoa. And maybe she was thinking, because he was preparing the way, so she's obviously thinking to herself, like, man, there's someone on this earth who is going to be soon birthing the, the Messiah. And then all of a sudden, as she's treasuring those things in her heart, Elizabeth doesn't say that she actually does that. Mary gets that a lot. But as Elizabeth is thinking about these things, surely she's like waiting for that moment to like, and like, like keeping count of like maybe whenever John is born and she'll like look at all the kids around him and be like, okay, who is he like kind of like going toward, you know, like maybe that's the Messiah. You know, you can see that that's kind of happening. And so you, you ask the question, like whenever Mary comes in and the baby leaps and all of a sudden she sees that Mary's pregnant or maybe she can't see it at that point because it's not that far along for Mary. But um, as this happens, all of a sudden Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit and she knows like this is the mother of the Messiah. This is amazing. She was filled with the Holy Spirit and she spoke this word, this blessing on Mary and this truth in scripture that we now have, Elizabeth confirmed the promise that Mary had. And what a sweet thing for God to do for all of us. Whenever we hear something from God and then we also get a little confirmation from other things, because sometimes we think we're crazy. You know, when it's like we get this message from the Lord or we feel like we've heard something from God and we're like, yeah, am I crazy? And then somebody will come up later and say, hey, I just, you know, God's telling me for whatever reason, I feel like I'm supposed to say this to you. And you're like, oh, okay. You're like, wow, thanks, God. Thanks. Like, the angel was cool, and that was an amazing thing. Maybe I'm crazy. But then someone else comes, and you're like, I'm not crazy. I love that story with, and Luke actually brings it up in the book of Acts, with Cornelius and Peter. When Peter is uh, told by the Lord, don't call things unclean that I've called clean as God was encouraging Peter to go to the Gentiles. And then all of a sudden, as he's having this vision from the Lord, he gets a knock on the door and Cornelius's men come up and they say, hey, Cornelius is calling you. He had a vision from the Lord. And you had this, um, what I call two-factor authentication from the Lord, all right? Which is very annoying when it comes to our phones, but it's very great whenever it's coming from God, okay? So he had this two-factor. And so Mary's got this two-factor uh, authentication, all right? And then from this, we go into what has been called the Magnificat, which is the beginning of uh, the Latin phrase for uh, this, uh, this song that Mary is going to sing. In Latin, it starts with the word Magnificat. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. Listen to that. My soul, my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior, Mary said. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maid servant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. Mary looks 
at the situation and what God is doing, and he, she looks and he, she says this, you are my savior. And you have regarded my lowly state. This is also a theme of Luke that we'll get into. God coming to the weak, God coming to the humble, God resisting the proud. This is a theme in all of scripture. We see it especially played out in the gospel of Luke. You have regarded my lowly state. From, for behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. Verse 49, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. I just want to take a moment and think about that for a second. Mary takes note of the personal nature of God's love and care. And maybe that could be our encouragement in this quick snippet from the word this morning is this, that we can take account of God's personal care in our lives. Yes, God works in the corporate. God works in in the church and God saves us to be part of the church and God has saved us overall like and and brought us into his kingdom and 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 it has this cosmic kind of feel but at the same time God loves you personally and me personally I resist saying that too much because we live personally uh, in an individualistic society and so I kind of steer away from that and I I push toward the corporate because I think that's good to remind us of but I think also it's a good reminder that God is personally involved and aware of all things that are going on in our lives. That God knows the number of hairs on your head. That God cares about your circumstance, your situation. That you are not a mistake. That you are not forgotten by God. You are important. Mary takes note of this in herself. God is holding you together. God is concerned with your day-to-day. He isn't unaware of your pain. He isn't unaware of your sadness. He is there, and he's working. Verse 50, now Mary takes her eyes off of herself and pushes it onto the corporate work that God's doing. And in this passage, in this Uh, prophecy in this song of Mary. There's just a ton of scripture from other places like the prayer of Hannah uh, in 1 Samuel. Tons of these things are coming out of Mary's words, which shows us probably that Mary knew her Bible. Okay, verse 50, it says this, and his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. Verse 51, he has shown strength with his arm and he has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. Verse 53, he has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. Verse 55, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. So here we have it, the overarching cosmic struggle that's been going on since the fall of humanity. God is here bringing his promise to light in the birth of the God-man Jesus. And as I said, this is Luke's theme. And God is doing it in probably a way that we never would have considered, that we never would have thought of. You know, I've put myself in God's shoes and probably... I would have done it a little differently. I would have maybe had Jesus be born, uh, maybe not born actually. I would have had him grown as a full man and I would have said, all right, go wreck shop, buddy. Go dominate the then known world and bring it under your rule and your authority. But that's not how God did it. God associated with the lowly in becoming a baby himself, a baby in utero. That's one of the weakest positions. You're so dependent on other people. But God decided that he would do that because God associates with the lowly. He has helped us. And it would take 30 years, some 30 years before all that would even come to fruition in Jesus, his life and his ministry and his death on the cross and his resurrection. 
and now still, it's taken 2,000 years after that moment, and we're still in this moment where sin is still prevalent. Sin is still here. And we can think the same thing as the people did of that time. Where are you, God? But may this be a reminder today that God is still on the move. He's not on our time schedule. He's on his. Verse 56, Mary remained with her for about three months and returned to her house. And so here is our east side challenge today. The first is this. Thank God for sending Jesus to this world. I don't know when the last time you actually did that was. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus overarchingly to this world that is lost in sin. Thank you for coming to this world on a rescue mission. And here's the second thing. Thank God for choosing you in your weakness. Like Mary, think and consider the places this last year that God has shown up in your life, that God has shown that he cares for you, that he knows you, and that he wants a relationship with you, that he is personally and intimately involved in your everyday life. And may I encourage you, read Psalm chapter 139 if you need reminder. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you that it is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of heart and soul. Lord, it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. God, if I just read the word this morning, it would do its work. Because your word, as the scriptures say, doesn't return void. It accomplishes what you sent it out to do. And so, God, we honor you this morning by reading your word. And we ask, God, that the things that we learn today from your word, that the Holy Spirit would continue to make those things alive in us. And that the words that we heard would not just be things that we know, like, okay, I know the historical context, I know some things about the Bible, but God, I pray that these things would translate into worship in our lives. Help us to know how to translate those things in that way, to worship and adoration of you. God, we thank you for sending Jesus to this world, and we thank you, God, that you have chosen us May we always come humbly before you and find grace and help in our times of need. We love you, and I pray you bless my family here today and the rest of the time that we have. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen.